The full-on 3D age of Mortal Kombat began in 2002, when this game hit the shelves on what was the next generation of systems at the time. Now, the funny thing is, of all 3D MK titles, it is the most hardcore of the hardcore player base that often say that it is this game that stands out as the finest 3D installment mechanically. And there are many truths to that that we'll be covering today. It didn't have the largest competitive scene in the world, but it started the foundations for what would be the following games over the next few years, and starting the journeys of many players that would stick around for years to come. Mortal Kombat has always been and always will be. And this is the MK meta of Mortal Kombat Deadly Alliance. Now before we get started on the MK meta of Deadly Alliance, I want to mention that this video is sponsored by Dash Fight. Dash Fight is a company that specializes in the high level education of fighting games. They cover a lot of Mortal Kombat 11 at the moment. They've done content with the likes of Video Game Joe on Shao Kahn, Foxy Grandpa on Sub-Zero, and Averk on Scorpion. If you want to get involved in high level fighting games, Dash Fight's YouTube channel is a great place to go, and I appreciate them from sponsoring this episode of MK meta. These videos take a lot of time to make and any kind of sponsorship is greatly appreciated. Now check out all of their social links, I'll put it in the comment and the description of this video and after this little teaser for what Dash Fight has to offer, the MK meta can officially begin. It's often overlooked just what Deadly Alliance started in the world of Mortal Kombat. There's a lot of things that would pretty much become staple across all of the games that followed, including modern times with NetherRealm Studios. The story is, Quan Chi and Shang Tsung have teamed up, taking out key threats along the way, causing Raiden to assemble a team of Earthrealm defenders to put a stop to the Deadly Alliance. Shao Kahn is the first casualty, then Liu Kang gets offed and they're about to reach their most dangerous point, with an army to resurrect and a well of souls ready to get the job done. You have your standard arcade mode, which isn't really anything new, obviously, but it's a great opportunity to earn in-game currency that can be spent in the crypt on new unlocks. Test Your Might returns every few fights, with Test Your Sight being a new one that's more of a memory game. This is how you earn the Onyx coins, which is technically the game's more finite currency. Conquest Mode is a string of tutorials that covers the entire game while feeding you lore at the same time. It's pretty cool, honestly. Not the conquest modes that came later, but a nice way to feed a bunch of new characters into the universe and expand on the game's story. By beating the conquest mode, you unlock a secret character in Blaze. But he's not particularly impactful to the game's meta, so for this video, we won't really be talking about him. MKDA marked the debut of The Crypt, a large assortment of coffins, all with different currency, granting all kinds of in-game content, behind-the-scenes content, and a hell of a lot more. A vast majority of the roster is actually locked out to you at the beginning, and The Crypt is how you unlock most of these characters. Shopping. The amount of modes and variety they offered has always gone down as THE first time that Mortal Kombat offered this much to players just looking to play the game casually and explore the universe. It would become a standard from this point on, and when you look at games like Mortal Kombat X or MK11, with their cinematic stories, challenge towers, minigames and much more, this really is where everything began. There was some bonus content as well, like an extensive history of Mortal Kombat up until this point, a making of video which was a fantastic insight into what went into making Deadly Alliance, and an official music video of the song Immortal, written by popular band at the time, Edema, that I'm not going to play here because I don't want to get DMCA'd. 
Okay, let's talk about the fact that Deadly Alliance was the first time a true 3D fighter game plan actually existed. MK4 had a sidestep, sure, so it wasn't a full-on 2D experience, but it had so much 2D gameplay to it anyway that it really did kind of fall somewhere in the middle. Deadly Alliance has a complete control of 3D movement, although you can still use jump attacks by doing a diagonal motion, jumping normally if you want, but pressing a button to attack from a jump as well. You have to note, however, that it only works with forward jumps. Jumping back is mobility only. Deadly Alliance was one of the absolute first times that what we now know as the modern input notation system started. It was used to describe all kinds of attacks because it's not high punch, low punch, high kick and low kick anymore. It is now one, two, three and four. In fact, it's even referred to that in the controller setup itself. Using the term one, two, three and four rather than the controller input meant that regardless of what console that you played on, you could follow inputs all the same. And that still very much rings true to this day. I'm going to give a brief breakdown of each basic move, although I've already covered this in my Armageddon meta, Deadly Alliance was the first, so let's quickly recap. 1 and 2 are your punches. 3 and 4 are your kicks. Change style will swap between fighting styles. R1 inputs a stance specific move, and block button is block, as you'd expect. Every button a character has will often do something specific. Maybe it will hit high, it hits low, mid, they all serve a purpose into a character's overall design. Highs are fast attacks that can often be crouched or low profiled. Mid attacks must be blocked standing, consider it what we now know as overheads. And lows must be blocked crouching. The mix-up between mid and low really is the most crucial mix-up in this game, as any time a throw becomes possible, in Deadly Alliance, they're actually blockable, making throws just another strike, in effect. It is not a grab game in any way. Characters do have special moves in this game, but in Deadly Alliance, there actually aren't a huge amount per character. It is a much more button-heavy game than specials. Combo strings are simply a combination of different buttons that are built-in combos. In Deadly Alliance, some of them are quite lengthy, and they involve changing stance more than once. They often bag the biggest damage before you've even done anything else. But on that note, let's discuss what Deadly Alliance introduced, starting with the fighting styles. Fighting styles are introduced for the first time in DA, Characters have two hand-to-hand -hand stances and one weapon stance. The hand-to-hand -hand stances have a collection of different attacks to each other, and the weapon stance generally does a bit more damage and has attacks that cannot be parried, with the trade-off of you taking significantly more damage when you have a weapon out. A couple of characters in this game, more likely the bonus characters, have no weapon and three fighting styles, but that's more character-specific, which is a story for another time. These hand-to-hand -hand styles do often get used in various ways. One stance might have better lows or safer mids. Maybe a stance doesn't have that much launch potential, but the other one does. It's not the kind of game that you look at and totally ignore a style in favor of another, because the moves do tend to be split quite nicely between the two, making a competitive match this interesting dance between movement, footsies, but also stance management, using the right stance for the right time. It's kind of intense. Weapon stance changes significantly from character to character. A character like Raiden has this long staff, which grants nice range, but then you have somebody like Jax, who has the Tonfa, which is significantly closer range. Often, the weapon stance fits nicely into a character's game plan because it is very much just an extra strength to have. Not used in every matchup, perhaps, and you have to be mindful of the extra damage you take, but a good weapon can be very powerful in the right hands. We'll expand on this later when we dive into characters. All three stances a character has contains what is called by the game as a special move, but we often refer to them as stance moves, stance attacks, something like that. It's a unique move that you only get while in that stance specifically, and the move varies heavily from character to character. A fair few of them are shared across the cast, and some are definitely better than others. Let's give a few examples. Taunt allows a character to heal a small portion of their life when the animation finishes, but it can take a bit long. Power-up grants a significant boost of damage for a short time. 
Shove is an unblockable shove that can be used to create space or obtain plus frames against a wall. Counter will stun an opponent in place and allow for a full combo. This is the move that weapons will totally blow through though, so if they have a strong weapon, counter doesn't really exist. Come on dude, do it! Come on! No, don't get the weapon out! No, oh, this is so hard to demonstrate with just one person. Come on! Nope! Nope! A common sword weapon attack is Impale, but unfortunately, it kind of sucks. It does damage over time when it lands, but you lose the weapon. And for characters where their weapon is very important, why would you want to get rid of it? It just doesn't make any sense. There are others like sidestep attacks, evades, backdashes, and more, but the usefulness of these stance attacks are a part that factors into a character's complete viability in Deadly Alliance. Some of them are really good, and some of them are pretty crap, to be honest. It is important to note that stances have different movement as well. Shang Tsung is one of the most notable examples with this, where his movement across the board is really good, but then his movement in Crane is out of this world good, particularly his sidestep, which when you step block, something we'll cover later, becomes unbelievably fast. Now, hardcore MK players that know of the competitive 3D age almost always say that Deadly Alliance is mechanically the best of the three that came out of this era. But why is that exactly? There are many factors at play to this question, but all of which really speak about the individuality of not only Deadly Alliance, but the games that would follow. It all comes down to mechanics, or in Deadly Alliance's case, a lack of. Let's talk about stages first. Aside from visuals, there actually isn't much that separates them. A circular arena, cut off at the end by an invisible wall. But the wall actually has a rather specific purpose here. People can splat into the wall, which creates an entirely new situation, but also there isn't the kind of 2D MK pushback when an attack lands against the wall mid-combo, so wall combos can extend a lot longer than you'd think into impressive damage, allowing for true wall-only combos to happen. The wall can also be used with certain moves like a stance attack shove for plus frames, which is a devastating tool for some characters. We would eventually see wall pushback on hit, but that was introduced in Deception onwards. Certain moves on the ground cause the wall splat situation. It can be basically tech rolled when it happens, but it's all about damage really when we're discussing the wall. As I've already said, wall combos are your absolute best source of damage in the entire game. On the subject of combos though, there isn't as much crazy launch potential as the other 3D games. Now, don't get me wrong, combos in this game can do an unreasonable amount of damage anyway, but you're not going to be seemingly just infinitely juggled like in Deception or Armageddon. Combos are a bit snappier, faster, more fitting into the overall fast pace that the game has, made even more satisfying by the fact this game does not have combo breakers. The only thing to prevent getting comboed in this game is to not get hit. The poke-heavy nature of the game is enforced by the fact that after a few hits on block, strings can actually be interrupted. It means you have to think twice about just doing big strings against somebody, because you can get punished real hard, either by a fast button, a sidestep, or a parry if the opponent has the right stance out. Deadly Alliance could be called the simpler of the three PS2 Age titles, mostly because it's all about the combat and nothing else. This was a game before combo breakers, but also before air combat, parries, delayed wake up, the different combo systems and juggle systems that would eventually become way more over the top. Deadly Alliance is very much more a straight up traditional 3D fighter, where the complexity comes from the smaller details. And some of those we can mention right now as we enter the tech. What did players do to push this game to the next level? Things that might not necessarily have been intentional. I do need to mention though as a disclaimer that when I say the simpler of the 3D titles, it's mostly because there aren't as much mechanics in play, meaning it is much more about the finite details of combat. So on a casual level there's not as much to it, but competitively it's all about those little details, which for a lot of players can be a very satisfying experience. Tech is apparent in every fighting game, and although some of these would carry over into other 3D MKs, Again, they started here. The first, and something I've already mentioned in my Armageddon meta, is Step Block. When you sidestep, 
tapping block lets you step and block at the same time, but what it also does is make your movement faster. Step block is apparent in every single match because it is your best way of staying mobile as pretty much every character, and your sidestep will vary from character to character, so some are better than others. Backdash cancel is a major part of competitive DA. A lot of single and two hit strings can be cancelled into a backdash. Now what this does for moves that can be backdash cancelled is take off a ton of their recovery frames, preventing them from being unsafe, turning the entire game into a much more poke heavy hit and run experience, as the lack of unsafe moves means that both players are likely to be keeping their own offense pretty airtight. Additionally to this, you can also jump cancel, which is essentially the same thing as backdash cancel, but you're canceling the recovery into a backwards jump. Jumping can make you a bit harder to hit, reducing incoming damage. Many attacks in the game can have their tracking improved by holding up. This will be more apparent for some moves than others, but making moves track a lot better is crucial in this game, as sidestep on defense can be used to blow up many attacks that have significant gaps in them, and this is often referred to as universal tracking. Certain attacks can keep you in a crouch state if you hold the down input. For example, Shang Tsung can do this, as can Reptile. It can be good to save you from certain situations the opponent might try and press a button. Deadly Alliance was a game that introduced a fair few new additions to the franchise. Not all of them would be super prominent, but certainly characters did stand out in their own way. People often wonder what the tier list was like for old games, and that's where this section comes into play. Let's break down some of the game's more impactful characters and why. Scorpion is said by most Deadly Alliance players to be the best character in the entire game. He is a blender of death, but also incredibly safe on his most prominent buttons. A character that rarely ever uses sword stance besides damage because his hand-to-hands are so effective, this character is all about comboing into a guaranteed unblockable hellfire, which gives a free mix-up on hit. Pigua stance has the shove, which is totally unfair with these moves and Hellfire combined. Throw on extreme safety and godlike tracking on top, Scorpion is an absolute Deadly Alliance powerhouse. Bo Raicho makes his first ever appearance in Mortal Kombat here, and although designed as a pretty obvious joke character, he is unbelievably strong. Drunken Master offers great buttons like 3-2, 2-3-2, and down 4, but there is one move that really pushes him over the edge, and that is Puke Puddle. As disgusting as it is, it is fully unblockable, and it stuns the opponent. Deadly Alliance is a game with almost no teleports or full screen side switches for the most part, so the Puke Puddle is a great zoning tool, but it also offers Bo Raicho unblockable infinites. Like this one. This is probably the most disgusting infinite in fighting game history, and what makes it worse is that it doesn't really do a lot of damage, so it's a timer scam infinite. So you just sit and watch it and listen to it the whole time. I'd rather not deal with that. Oh, it's just so bad. Reptile is another top 5 character, and one that I've extensively covered in my competitive history series. But for a quick recap, all three stances are really good. He has mid to low mix for days, incredible poke potential with backdash cancelling, a shove in one stance and a counter in another, and effective damage across the board. Reptile is incredibly safe and plays the meta of Deadly Alliance fantastically well. Sonya Blade is another top tier character in this game, and it all comes down to her Taekwondo stance. Her other stances are great too, especially the kendo sticks, but it is Taekwondo that just totally blends you up. This stance has lows, mids, which remember are basically overheads, safety, damage all day. Sonya is possibly the most rushdown oriented character in the entire roster, and it is almost a total non stop guessing game the moment she gets close. She has really strong specials, like a stunning kiss, and if you like rushdown characters, pick Sonya. It's as simple as that. Now, Dramin is another brand new character to the universe, and on first glance, you'd actually think that he sucked. A lot of people to this day still think that on a casual level. He hasn't got a lot of moves, barely any combos. I mean, how can this character possibly be good against everything else that I've just mentioned? I'll tell you what, 
iron club stance. That's how. He has 50-50s with his weapon back three low and his mid-hitting forward throw. The throw launches and it actually infinites on its own. However, even if you disallow the infinite, which was common, the throw leads to a guaranteed power-up, which Iron Club gets, and it has insane combo damage for basically no execution. Fly Toss guarantees an unblockable ground pound. Jumping to beat the ground pound is easier said than done, thanks to Deadly Alliance and the general movement, but his best tools having backdash cancel makes life miserable, considering he has absolutely the best backdash in the game. Dramin is a zoner, and the best zoner the roster has to offer. Finally, remember what I said about weapons blowing through counters? They can't be parried. Dramin only plays in Iron Club, so on top of having all of this, you can't parry a single move that he has. Another new character, Frost, has a notorious infinite as well. Hers are tied to her two special moves in Slide and Ground Freeze. It has something to do with the opponent being stuck turning around and unable to block that these two moves basically get looped. Without the infinite, she's not seen by too many to be on the level of the absolute top tiers, but she is still a very strong character in the game, and a character that some players do rate quite highly. Su Hao is a new addition, and look, the community does tend to meme on this guy, but in his first appearance, he's a damn good character. His wrestling stance and weapon are his two more prominent stances, and he's got layers of mix-ups and loops. You can backdash cancel his best moves and weapon stance, so he's incredibly safe, and he's just a real brawler. One that does a ton of damage and seemingly has offense that feels like it just goes on forever. It's kind of funny looking back and seeing that Meat's wrestling stance in Armageddon and the one button command grab infinite that he has, if grabs were unblockable in Deadly Alliance, Su Hao would have had it first. Now, let's cover characters on the weaker side, because they are just as prominent when discussing the game's meta. Some characters got picked a lot, but at the same time, why did others not get picked as much? Cyrax is the worst character in the entire game. It is not open for discussion. He has weak stance moves, does such little damage that you just don't need to fear his options, and only has a few good buttons per stance that are worth using. If he had more damage, he'd be a lot better, but the reality is he is just not a threatening character at all. I cover this in detail in my Cyrax competitive history, but in Deadly Alliance, he doesn't feel particularly polished or finished. He's a much better character in Armageddon when a bunch of new moves were added that makes him a stronger pick. Sub-Zero falls into that category as well, surprisingly. Another generally low damage character and missing some important moves that he'd be given later down the line in Armageddon. His low options aren't so hot, so his mix-ups are weak, and the low damage doesn't help. The best thing that he has going for him is his Ice Shaker, because it works as a defensive tool or parry, in a way. You'd think maybe he could at least combo into Impale, seeing as he does have a true stun, right? But unfortunately, he can't. The Impale will hit, but the Impale itself actually won't come out. It's just damage. Finally here, Natara is actually considered of the weaker side because of a total lack of utility. The one and only thing going for her is damage, because when in power-up, she can actually bag combos that do over 100%. But in a real match, getting that damage versus somebody in the know is pretty difficult, and you're just left with a limited toolset. She's always been one of the more fondly remembered characters in the 3D age, and for good reason, she's a really cool character in my opinion, but in DA she's not actually as good as you'd think by seeing just her combo damage on its own. Now, there's always more to discuss with characters, but as always, you can't recover every character with a roster of this size in an MK meta. Here, we got the good and the bad, and those in the middle can be covered at a later date, one by one. Community is what competitive fighting games are all about, and this is where Deadly Alliance stands out in kind of a strange way. The game that came out before this was Mortal Kombat 4, which did totally fine on consoles, but the competitive community very much belonged to the arcade scene at that time. An arcade scene that was on the decline, as when Mortal Kombat 4 launched, the arcade industry was at a massive decline. Deadly Alliance didn't have online play. It was a different time back then. Almost no fighting game had access to online until games like MK Deception and Capcom vs SMK on Dreamcast would offer online methods in the early 2000s. But this was nowhere near a standard. 
With the competitive MK community being the arcade crowd and not much of a competitive console scene for Mortal Kombat, Deadly Alliance was very much what I would refer to as a forum game. And that forum, to this day, would be websites like mk5.org, which was the main one, and years later, testyourmite.com. You can still go back to Test Your Might in 2021 and find old Deadly Alliance forums where community members are discussing characters, gameplay, tier lists, and more. But this was a little bit more of a retrospect, as those threads were around in about 2007 or so. There really wasn't much of a competitive community of people that would be able to play it with each other on a regular basis. MK5.org was a prominent website that the likes of Rio would often talk about when discussing the online scene's humble beginnings, a website that would become MortalCombatOnline.com. MK5.org can still be salvaged using web archives, and it's always interesting to look at people discussing the game as early as 2003. Unfortunately though, a lot of the actual threads themselves seem to be lost. We can find their names and the users that made them, but actually going into the threads might not be something that we can do anymore. As somebody who is dedicated to keeping old Mortal Kombat history alive for the new generation, that makes me really sad. By the way, MK5.org, back then, there were people out there that referred to DA as MK5, in tournament posts and advertisements of the community. Rather than calling it a Deadly Alliance tournament, sometimes they'd call it a Mortal Kombat 5 tournament. That's the only time I'd ever seen it be called that. Now, obviously, it's just Deadly Alliance by itself. The most prominently remembered 3D MK community in the offline space belonged to the east coast of North America. This was where you'd have players like Rio, Tom Brady, and then check these mega old school community members that would be seen in videos and the like playing offline at the highest level. But back then, it was actually common for 3D fighting games like Tekken, Dead or Alive, and Soul Calibur to have their own dedicated 3D events. And Deadly Alliance wouldn't be a headlining game at those events. It was more common that a 3D fighting game tournaments, Deadly Alliance had a chance of being there for fun, or would have the occasional tournament for those just looking to take part in something different. It was sometimes a main game, but not always. Amazingly, there is actually footage from a Deadly Alliance tournament in Texas in 2003, which was advertised on MK5.org, and a lot of the tournament would be fully recorded by a hand camera. Clearly, at this event, you have different skill levels. Some people are clearly more experienced than others, but as we hit the later part of these tournaments, you can start to see players who really knew their stuff at the time. Remember that in 2003, your learning resources are not as common as they are today. So knowing this much high-level strats for an offline-only fighting game is very impressive. You know it's old school as well, because during this tournament, you can actually hear players being called out to play their Soul Calibur 2 matches. In the grand finals, we can see Sonya, we can see Bo Raicho. I mean, these have always been the top tier characters of the game. This tournament does enforce just what competitive Deadly Alliance was at the time. On March 22nd, there would be a tournament called Tournament in Texas 5, and it was advertised originally on Tekken Zaibatsu, which was a competitive Tekken forum. It was announced early, February of 2003, and alongside Tekken Tag Tournament and Tekken 4, they added Deadly Alliance to the list, with a shorter entry fee, but an official game very much. The tournament winner would be MKL, which is short for MK Legend, which, believe it or not, was an original gamer tag of one Tom Brady, who was one of DA's most dominant players, also showcasing his talents earlier in Mortal Kombat 4, said by many in America to be the best MK4 player going. NEC on the East Coast, a tournament that is still going to this day, would feature Deadly Alliance as an official game on two separate occasions. But as you might expect, they're not really that documented on the internet anymore. Although they would continue to gather prominent hardcore members of the MK community, such as Brady, Rio, and more. The seeds of the East Coast having a die-hard MK scene were sown this early, and even beforehand, the 3D community existed in some ways, and on the East Coast, it was one of the only places you'd ever find it. Period. However, to the greater fighting game community, Deadly Alliance didn't quite have the complexity of its competition, like Tekken, for instance, which was really big at that period. Mortal Kombat fans were chomping at the bit for something new, and Deadly Alliance would be that new experience for the time, but it would, at the very least, begin the 3D journey, 
one that would expand even greater still when its sequel would come out, MK Deception, with online play, creating much more of a global community. But a story for another time. To the casual MK fan, Deadly Alliance was a vital game for opening the floodgates on single-player content expanded lore and general game modes. To the hardcore player, it was necessary for starting the journeys of key prominent figures, but also laying even more foundations for what would eventually become a global Mortal Kombat community many years later. Websites that would become more established with later titles, and one of the first times ever a competitive community could play in tournaments that had midway testers present to discuss player to developer balance topics. Above all else though, it is Deadly Alliance remaining the most mechanically honest of the 3D titles. And like I said at the beginning, many 3D MK players hold Deadly Alliance at the top of the 3D MK tier list. It is incredibly fun to learn and these days, your best bet for playing it is to jump into discords and online emulation. Thank you so much to the players who helped me with the always important research period. Boos for being an absolute knowledge tank, especially in modern times, Tom Brady of course for helping me with the tournament side of things, and players like GR Master for always being around to play with or generally discuss 3D MK with. One final thanks to Dayrax who's very much a modern 3D MK player who again played a bunch of games with me and helped with specific characters. He's the one beating me up in a lot of this footage. As always, these videos are not possible without the help of other people, so I always appreciate your time. Thank you again to Dash Fight for being the official sponsor of this episode of the MK Meta. Once again, in the description and pinned comment, I have all the information that you need for their competitive fighting game website, with tips, tricks, guides with top players, and even more. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. If you want to expand your support, consider maybe supporting my official Patreon, and I will see you next time. Peace out, much love, and take care. 